student at the University of Oklahoma in the 1900s. Um, Donald Lipsky was one of the exciting faculty there that was helping things stir things up and getting students excited about making art and being part of an arts community. And um, I think one of the things I, I admired about Donald, even though he wasn't in my area at the time, he was doing 3D design and ceramics. Um, but I, I kind of modeled myself later in some respects on the fact that he was one of the guys that would sort of wander through the studios and see what all his students were doing in their other classes and uh, kind of help them draw connections between their practice and what they were, what they were experiencing elsewhere. Um, so there's always been in my mind, at least a kind of multidisciplinary aspect to Donald's approach to making art. And I think we'll see that after having left Oklahoma and uh, rerouted himself back in the Northeast, that that uh, multidisciplinary approach has followed in him, him into his work as a, uh, an artist making public art. So welcome back to Oklahoma, Don. It's good to have you here. Uh, thank you. Uh, let's see, how do I get, uh, am I on the screen? So to share screen, just go ahead and go down and click on, you know, the share screen button. Oh, and share then, screen. Yeah, choose okay. the one that you want to share. Okay, I'll go ahead and share my screen. Let's see if we could do this. Is that happening? That's happening. Uh, That's happening. Uh, mm -hmm. hmm. uh, yeah. Let's see. Hang on, we'll just do this. Okay, there we go. This, uh, are, are you all seeing what I'm seeing? I think so. Okay. So you knew circa 1970. <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, right after graduate school, I got a job teaching uh, at the University of Oklahoma in Norman. Uh, and this is me, maybe 27 years old. Uh, I was there from 1973 to 77, and they were great years. I loved, I loved the university. I loved Norman, uh, and I just had a wonderful time there. Uh, I had been saving little sculptures I had been making since I was a child uh, that I called Gathering Dust, and I first showed them at the University Museum. Uh, in 1978, I moved to New York hoping to show them, uh, and the next year I actually had a show of them at the Museum of Modern Art. Uh, now, while I continued uh, to make art and installations uh, for galleries and museums, uh, all these things got larger and uh, more elaborate. Uh, and to this day, storage is a giant problem. Uh, eventually, opportunities uh, to work in the pub public realm came up and I was hooked. Uh, I, I now have works, uh, let's get to where that map is, across the country. Um, but you can see there is nothing in Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so we'll, we'll try to fix that the next few years. That would be great. Um, there are uh, quite a few in, well, why didn't that work? Oh, okay. There are quite a few in Texas uh, and I thought I'd show them to you. Uh, they're, they're all pretty good sculpture stories. Uh, one of the first pieces I made was at the Fort Worth Convention Center. And it's sort of a typical story. I was thinking about cowboy art uh, and I had designed a large Texas star made out of antlers. I presented it at a public meeting and the mayor, Mike Moncrief, uh, who was ignorant of the fact that deer shed their horns said, uh, but the children will all be thinking about all the dead deer. So uh, antlers were out and the antlers changed to cowboy hats. Uh, so we had a big party 
and the admission was you had to bring a hat. Uh, and the mayor and the wife gave me hats. And eventually we got all the hats we needed, uh, including one from uh, George Bush Sr. Uh, and one from the actor Chill Wills. Uh, and there's the piece uh, hanging in the middle of the entrance. Um, and it hangs from a, a, a single cable. So it moves with the HVAC. Um, in San Antonio, uh, they have a beautiful WPA arrow river walk. And a few years ago, they, they extended it from this downtown loop up the river about a mile or so, and just past the museum as it goes under I-35, I suggested filling it with a school of goldfish. Then people started telling me about the long-eared sunfish, uh, which is native to the San Antonio River. And when kids learn to fish down there with a, a pole and a worm, you know, this is generally the first thing they catch. So, so I just goldfish. love the story. I made 25 fish, each uh, seven feet long. Um, and that's the museum there in the background. And uh, they light up at night. And uh, each evening, uh, crowds gather to see the lighting of the fish. Uh, there's a bunch of a uh, colony of bats that lives under the highway. And the bats all fly out. And then the uh, lights light up. And everybody cheers and then heads to the cantina. Uh, El Paso. Uh, in El Paso, right near the university, uh, I confronted an incredibly challenging site. Uh, it's at a busy intersection. Uh, it's a very complicated roundabout, and it's been sunken into the ground uh, to make a sort of underpass for students coming from a huge parking lot. And there was uh, also the given of footings, three footings that had already been built in to hold whatever the winning artist designed. Uh, and it had this horrible painting in it. So it was rough all around. Uh, through a quirk of fate, uh, the university's architecture is modeled on Bhutan of all places. Uh, the kingdom in the clouds. And I ended up making a triangle of clouds uh, that stands up like a billboard. And that's, uh, that's Juarez in the background. And they're made of panels that are hinged and blow in the breeze. So the thing is constantly moving, even in a very small breeze. Uh, we completely assembled the piece in the parking lot and moved it as one piece uh, with what I was told was the biggest crane in South Texas. Uh, so as sculptors, I thought you would like to see uh, this thing being moved. Um, during COVID, uh, the parking lot became a testing area. Uh, here's, here's what the piece felt like. Oh, let me go back. Uh, how do we do this? We'll go. This is what it feels like for pedestrians. Uh, and at, at night, it's lit by, you can see the lights at the bottom. They're all around it and just shine up onto it. Uh, in Houston in 2008, I won a competition to make something at a new water treatment plant they were building. I had designed uh, this bouquet of bathtubs uh, with the faucets on and all overflowing one into another. Uh, then Homeland Security decided that the place would be closed to the public. So the whole idea of having public art there was out the window. Um, 
So the public art people down in Houston started looking for another place for me to put uh, the fountain. Really difficult and they never found any place. You can imagine it's very, very rough to find a, a safe place to put this. Uh, so finally, they suggested that I make a completely different sculpture for a different site. And they suggested Buffalo Bayou Park, uh, which is a long, wonderful park along the river. Uh, and down at one end, there was a sort of an entrance. Um, and back in the 90s, I had gotten some huge six inch diameter rope from a place in Houston called Southwest Ocean Supplies and made some art out of it. Uh, and ar around the same time, I made this 11 foot diameter rope ball uh, in Gateshead, England. Uh, I, I later showed it at the Whitney Museum in New York. So I thought that this big rope ball uh, might be just the thing for their entrance to the park. Uh, but while I was down there visiting, uh, they pointed out that under what they called the Sky Lawn, uh, which is a big open space with an amphitheater, uh, they had rediscovered an abandoned underground cistern, one and a half times the size of a football field. Uh, and they were able to take me down into there and I was just blown away. Uh, so I, I abandoned the idea of a rope ball and instead, I made a periscope to look down into the cistern. Uh, it operates with video rather than uh, optically. Uh, and we designed it so that besides viewing it at the site, uh, you can see it and control it from your computer uh, or even from your phone. Uh, I built a cross-shaped trellis uh, over it for shade and planted jasmine, uh, which has come in beautifully. Uh, the park, since I did this, has actually air conditioned the cistern uh, and built an entrance uh, where small groups can actually go in. Um, and they have temporary art exhibits down there, all of which you can watch uh, with the periscope. Unfortunately, uh, the electronics fried during Hurricane Harvey. This is actually Buffalo Bayou Park right here. Uh, we've redesigned them and rebuilt them and everything's been difficult because of COVID. Uh, but I'm hoping that in the next month or so, it'll be back up and running. Uh, this next piece wasn't uh, made as a public artwork. Uh, but uh, there it is at the University of Texas in Austin. Um, in 1990, I was uh, doing an, an exhibit in uh, Seattle and I went driving around the country there. And in Everett, Washington, I came around to uh, a pile of some old ocean mooring buoys. And I made this pyramid at the Walker Art Center in Minneapolis. Uh, it was meant as a temporary piece to be there for a year. Uh, but about four years later, I got a call. Uh, they were through with it. Where should they send it? Well, ha, you, you know, you can imagine. There are 54 buoys, each five feet in diameter. Uh, you can fit six of them into a semi. Uh, after some thinking and hustling around, uh, we sent them down to Lawmeyer Sculpture Garden in St. Louis uh, and joined them together like a string of pearls with big bolts uh, into a, a line 100 yards long. But in the beginning, as I was making the pyramid, I shipped several of the buoys to my studio in Brooklyn and made some other pieces, uh, like this one covered in dice, uh, shown here at the uh, Museum of Fine Arts in Houston. Uh, and this piece covered with corroded pennies that I called the West. It was bought by the Metropolitan Museum in New York. Uh, this is a little aside, but this photo showed up in the New York Times that mysteriously shows 
what is the spitting image of my father, even though he had passed away. And he's not identified here. He's just a visitor looking very carefully at the nameplate. So that's just something I wanted to show you. At any rate, the piece was shown on the lawn of the White House uh, when Clinton was president. Uh, and I think it gave a whole new meaning to the piece. Uh, and now it's been on loan at UT for a number of years. Uh, Alan asked me to show you the next piece. Uh, it's a good example of how these projects can really change uh, dramatically. In Goodyear, Arizona, just west of Phoenix, uh, is the Goodyear Ballpark where the Cleveland Indians and now also the uh, Cincinnati Reds hold their spring training. My idea was a feather made out of baseball bats. Uh, it was a competition and this was selected. Uh, it both referred to the team and also to Goodyear's aviation history. There was a problem though, uh, the actual Indians. Uh, the Native American community there is big and they're vocal and they already had a big beef with the Cleveland Indians uh, from the logo to the very name of the team itself. Uh, I reached out to the Heard Museum of American Indian Art in Phoenix, and they put me in touch with some prominent native artists, and it was a great learning experience. Uh, I learned that the feather is a sacred object for them. Uh, it's never supposed to touch the ground. Uh, so I put my uh, feather up on a pedestal, and the people I was talking to liked this, and they thought that that would make it okay. Uh, and while I was at it, I uh, lobbied the team for them to do a logo change. Uh, that's a whole other story that we could talk about sometime if you want. Uh, but eventually, 10 years later, they've dropped the mascot completely and changed their logo. And at the end of this coming year, they're changing the name to, I don't know what, but it won't be the Indians anymore. Well, once this discussion went public, uh, the team didn't even wanna deal with it. Uh, so even though my feather idea uh, had been picked by a committee that included the team's representatives, the feather just wasn't going to happen. Uh, so I offered to come up with a new idea. Uh, considering the pedestal had made me think of Brancusi uh, his pedestals were always ambiguous. Uh, they were both stands for the work and, and actual equal parts of the sculpture. Uh, and I thought about his bird in space. Uh, he made a series of these over 20 years. So I thought to make a big one uh, with stitches in it like a baseball. And the landscape architect suggested that we put it in a pool. And that's what we did. Uh, I called it the Ziz after a giant bird in uh, Jewish mythology. Um, I had suggested that it would be 60 feet tall. And one of the team representatives said, you know, the distance from home plate to the pitcher's mound is 60 feet, six inches. So that's how big we made it. Um, and uh, just as I had imagined for the feather, uh, its height out there in the desert uh, makes it a real landmark. Um, and the town has embraced it. Uh, it's been really popular. Um, they named their uh, mascot Zizzy after the sculpture. And it is uh, the goofiest mascot in the world, I think. Uh, Here's another good story about a, a piece changing. Um, about five blocks from my apartment in New York, uh, stretching out along the East River is New York University's hospital, a giant sprawling institution. And they were building a wonderful new children's hospital and needed a sculpture 
uh, to go right there. So the designer, the interior designer for the hospital had a theme of New York landmarks. And I thought about a taxi. Uh, that's how most of the young patients would arrive. My idea was a giant stuffed animal dog holding an actual taxi as if it were its personal toy. Uh, I love the irony of this toy thinking an actual taxi was its toy. The committee loved it and I set in to design it, uh, trying out different sorts of dogs, etc. cetera. Uh, but in stepped this woman, uh, Dr. Catherine Mano, the head of pediatrics. And she thought it was just plain too childish. She challenged me to think broadly about what the sculpture would mean, not just for the kids, uh, but for the staff, for the hospital. She wanted something more dignified. So I thought seriously about it uh, and I came up with this, uh, an actual dog. And that's what we did uh, using an actual taxi, a Prius. Uh, the dog uh, named Spot, uh, besides being playful, has the assets we hope to find in our doctors, focus uh, and confidence and patience and playfulness, sweetness. Uh, so her, our, her input, I think, made it a better artwork. Uh, and this is how public art should work. Uh, this, is, uh, this is my friend Chris Collins, a Philadelphia realist sculptor who modeled the dog for me. Uh, I call myself a sculptor, but I don't know how to do this. But I've now used him on uh, four different projects. Um, it's become uh, some of a, somewhat of a landmark. It's on 34th Street, right near the East River. And there are ferries, and there are helicopters, and seaplanes. Uh, and I'm always seeing great posts about the piece. Uh, this is a, a picture my son took. Um, this is Officer uh, Scomello and canine, uh, his, his dog Horn. Uh, he patrols that area uh, and he taught Horn uh, this trick. Uh, by the way, uh, Spot now has her own face mask. You know, she wears it to protect you. Uh, I thought you'd like to see the engineering that holds up the taxi. Uh, the taxi has a, a pipe that runs through it uh, and the pipe, uh, and there's a pipe that sticks out of the dog's nose that fits right inside the other pipe and then gets sucked up. There's the pipe, you can see right beneath the license plate, there's a break in the bumper and that's where the nose slides in uh, to that thing. Yeah, there we go. Uh, it's disappointing uh, when you're in one of these competitions, you know, and after you fall in love with an idea and you put in a tremendous amount of work, uh, and thinking it up is the creative part. But when you don't get it, it's really disappointing. Um, but often these ideas lead somewhere uh, that you wouldn't expect. About five years ago, I was in a competition to make something for a park along the river in Tampa, Florida. Uh, I'd be, been cutting holes in this canoe uh, and stuffing them with rolled up newspapers. And I based my proposal on canoes cut out in elaborate filigree patterns. Uh, I planned to make some sort of a flower out of them. Uh, a competition, again, they selected someone else. Uh, but just a few months later, there was a project in Virginia Beach where they were replacing an important bridge that spans an inlet on the Chesapeake Bay. I proposed uh, my canoe sculpture 
uh, for a pedestrian walkway that runs along the bridge near the foot of the bridge. And uh, there it is uh, in all its glory. Uh, it's really popular uh, and it's become uh, a meeting place for all sorts of groups and events. Lights up at night. Uh, this is the selfie spot. Uh, this is a sculpture uh, that some of you might know. Um, I, in 1992, I proposed it for a new public school in the Washington Heights neighborhood of Manhattan. Uh, kids are supremely interested in scale uh, and it's reflected in their literature. Uh, Alice in Wonderland and James and the Giant Peach and so forth. Uh, so it was approved by a committee, uh, but the actual community hadn't seen it. And when they heard about it, they were not happy. Uh, it's by and large a Dominican community. And what I heard was that the horse was a symbol of repression since the conquistadors used horses. Well, the sculpture was more or less built at the time uh, that all this controversy arose. And we we're at a real impasse. So I made a deal with the school construction authority that I would make another school, another sculpture for a different school and trade it for the chair. Uh, and I made something for the LaGuardia High School of Music and Art uh, which is the school in the movie Fame, right behind Lincoln Center. And over the two entrances to their auditorium, I made a suite of sculptures uh, made out of instruments, costumes, and so forth. Uh, I was able to get objects donated for it, uh, like these violins from a children's program in Harlem, uh, ballet shoes from the New York City Ballet, uh, costumes from a collection of, of from the collection of Broadway Theater Development Fund, uh, and so forth. And now I owned the sculpture, uh, and I managed to have it exhibited in uh, a corner of Central Park, right on Fifth Avenue, and it was up there for about six months. Uh, and while it was there, a woman from Denver. Uh, Oh, I, I, uh, I'm jumping ahead. Uh, it was pictured in People magazine uh, and it ended up on a, uh, in a walk by on Law and Order. Uh, and this woman from uh, Denver named Nancy Teakin saw it and loved it and bought it and donated it to the library um, in, uh, in Denver. Uh, and there it sits. And th this is an important spot. This is, uh, uh, it's, it's right out there in the middle of the city. Um, the, uh, the state capitals at one end and uh, city hall is at the other end and the Denver Art Museum is in between and the historical center and the library and then there, right in the middle of the whole thing is, is my work. Um, so it's constantly on social media and uh, pe people just love it. They've gotten tattoos, people have gotten married there and uh, it's, it's, it was voted the most popular sculpture in Denver at one point. Uh, this not only makes this sculpture outside the Denver Public Library, Shares its name with a Marjorie Finley Rowling's work. Lynn. It's the yearling? Yes. Uh, we go for six. So I like that. Uh, and uh, this is my son. And he actually grew up thinking, because of this picture, he thought that the sculpture was his idea. And I finally told him it wasn't when he was 25. So. Uh, okay, I'm going to show you one last piece. Uh, 
And this is something I'm working on now. Uh, and you'll get the idea pretty quickly. Uh, Philadelphia is making a new police headquarters uh, in the historic Art Deco building that was the home of the Philadelphia Inquirer newspaper. Uh, I got the commission just before the pandemic. What I designed is a giant badge studded with hundreds of actual police badges of all the ranks. Uh, and it'll hang in the lobby where the public comes in to interact with the police. Uh, and it'll be double-sided. So through a window, it also faces Broad Street, which is a major street, like a big sign. Uh, this was my idea, and I thought it was timely and, uh, and, and uh, stately. And I thought it was just perfect, and it got chosen. So, uh, but then uh, George Floyd was murdered, uh, and the whole world changed. Uh, I had thought of the badge as a shield, as a, a symbol of protection, uh, but I quickly realized that for half of Philadelphia, they saw the badge as a symbol of fear and repression. Uh, and I didn't know if I should just turn my back on it and say I really didn't want to do anything for the Philadelphia police, which um, so I started to think, uh, can I take this badge, uh, something that's meant to celebrate the police and their service and somehow transform it into something that all the communities could look at and feel respected and included. So I set about trying to do that. Uh, in the center of every badge, uh, is the seal of the city. It's on every badge of every rank. Uh, it's on the city's flag uh, and it's all around the city uh, in, in many different presentations. So I felt it was okay to take some liberties with it. Uh, so uh, here are the changes I've made. The Greek goddesses on the, on the seal represent peace and plenty. And I've now given them the faces of actual outstanding women from Philadelphia's history. Uh, Lucretia Mott and Frances Harper. On the left, peace is now Lucretia Mott. She fought all her life for abolition and women's rights. Uh, in 1848, at the Seneca Fall Convention that she organized with Elizabeth Cady Stanton, uh, she penned the Declaration of Sentiments. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men and women are created equal. She was widely judged by her contemporaries as the greatest American woman of the 19th century. The figure Peace holds a scroll in her hand. Uh, originally, the scroll depicted William Penn's street plan. Uh, he was determined to have a peaceful relationship with the Native Americans, so he devised a street plan with no fortifications in it. Now, I've replaced this with the quote on Peace and Justice by Martin Luther King Jr. True peace is not merely the absence of tension, it's the presence of justice. Uh, it's also inscribed here on a wall at the King Memorial on National Mall. On the right side, plenty is now Frances Harper, a Philadelphia abolitionist, suffragist, and poet, one of the first American women to be published in the United States. A century before Rosa Parks, she refused to give up her seat and ride in the so-called colored section of a segregated Philadelphia trolley. An excerpt from one of her poems is on a wall in the contemplative court of the National Museum of African-American History. 
all that my yearning spirit craves is bury me not in a land of slaves. And as plenty holds a cornucopia, I've filled it with emblems of medical care, housing, uh, education, justice, uh, the sort of plenty that so many who enter this world without advantages so sorely need. I had based my seal on this beautiful one uh, that hangs at the Municipal Services Building right across from City Hall in Philadelphia. Uh, it was made by a sculptor in the 60s named Dexter Jones. Uh, ironically though, it's right behind a statue of racist one-time police chief and mayor Frank Rizzo, uh, which quickly uh, became a target of protests uh, and was finally removed by the city last June. At the bottom is, uh, is a of the scroll is the motto, Philadelphia Manetto, uh, which I changed to the English, let brotherly love endure. Um, I had to present my changes not only to the committee that had selected me that had police on it uh, and to the uh, uh, Arts Commission, but I had to present it to the police commissioner, uh, who's this woman named, ironically, uh, Danielle Outlaw. Um, she had just joined, uh, taken this job uh, the January before COVID broke out. So she has really been through the mill and she's an extraordinary woman. Uh, she, she had come here from running the police department in Portland. So she told me this story. Uh, she said, when she first came here, people said to her, welcome to the city of brotherly love and sisterly affection. Well, that didn't go over that well with her. Uh, and after the conversation, uh, I changed let brotherly love endure to simply let love endure. Uh, the other changes I've done, I took the scales of justice at the top of it and made them much bigger. Uh, and finally, I've given all the badges on the sculpture, uh, the actual badges, the number 2020. Uh, it's the year that I created this sculpture in essence. Uh, and it's, it's one for the books, uh, like 1776. Uh, we and our children will always regard this as a pivotal time. Uh, and it's the 150th anniversary of the 15th Amendment, giving black men the right to vote. And it's the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment when women finally won the right to vote. So these are my subtle but profound changes. Again, Chris Collins is sculpting this for me. Uh, and these are ones uh, that I feel will move the sculpture a step in the direction of justice. Uh, and I like to think that someday the police uh, will live up to it. So that's my talk. Uh, if you tell me now, let's see, I'll stop the share and I'd love to talk with you about anything you wanna talk about. No, oh, that was so great. Thank you so much for sharing with us about your work. I loved hearing the stories uh, about the, the different pieces. Um, I know that I have some uh, questions in mind, but I want to make sure that we uh, let the audience ask questions as well. Um, so maybe be thinking about what questions you want to ask. One thing that um, I'm curious about is, you know, I think a lot of people have trouble seeing how to transition to working so large. Um, and you know, you work in, in such a variety um, of media. I was wondering if you could talk about um, building 
relationships with fabricators. You know, oh. sort of how, how, you, how you've done that over the years and what's worked for you, if you have any advice in that realm. Uh, when uh, the yearling, let's see, am I, should I be on the screen or am I just by talking? Uh, you are, and I, you know, you can always go into gallery view if you want, and then you can see everyone at, at once. Uh, well, you control it, I, you know, whatever you think is. Well, we can, we can definitely see you when you're talking. Okay, okay good. Um, when the yearling, the uh, horse on the chair, uh, was the first big sculpture I made, the first public artwork. Um, and I knew a steel fabricator uh, out where my summer house is on uh, Long Island, uh, a guy named John Deegan at a place called Liberty Iron Works. And he is just great. And he's worked on maybe about three pieces of mine. Uh, the horse I got from a, a manufacturer in Beverly Hills that makes horses by and large they make horses and paint them to look like uh the horses owned by rich people you know that they want to have and it was made out of fiberglass and uh after being in the uv light in uh mile high high city denver uh it started to disintegrate and we were repainting it every year. Uh, finally, they uh, took the horse and pulled a mold off of it and cast the horse in bronze and then painted it to look like the fiberglass, which I thought was great. Uh, and the, uh, the original horse went to uh, then Mayor Hickenlooper's office. And when he became governor, they carried the horse uh, across the park, right past the other horse, looking down at it, to his new office as uh, governor. At any rate, when I did that piece, I met a, the man who was running the public art program in Denver is a guy named John Grant. And we really hit it off. Uh, a couple of years later, I won a competition to do a piece in De another piece in Denver. And during that, we talked about how maybe we could work together. And over the years, he has become my project manager. Uh, and the way I find fabricators is I say, John, we need somebody to make, uh, you know, uh, whatever it is. And he has just, he's, because he had been running the public art program in Denver, he had worked on a hundred different projects and knew all sorts of things. Uh, the, second, the second project I did uh, was in Grand Central Terminal in New York, and it was an upside down tree that's a, like a big chandelier. Um, and I asked an old student of mine from Oklahoma uh, Don Howlett, who had knew a lot about building stuff, uh, they, they had asked him to uh, redo Watts Towers in uh, Los Angeles. And he just knows about everything. And he turned me on to uh, a, a woman who makes artificial trees for zoos and stuff uh, for the uh, the fish piece in Austin and two other fish pieces I've made. Uh, I found a guy who was the world champion taxidermist, fish taxidermist in Florida. Uh, that most taxidermy, fish taxidermy, it's catch and release. And then you, you, you say, well, you know, I caught a, a marlin that was 100 inches long and, and he would make you one. So, that uh, uh, I've had some bad experiences with uh, with fabricators, and with that, when that happens, you just my feeling is uh, 
you just be real nice and really plead with them and try to give them pride in their work and do the best job they can possibly do. Uh, the people who built the, the periscope in Houston, they were recommended to me as a Houston group who's done a lot of engineering for oil drilling rigs and stuff and they were supposed to be great and they did a horrible job and that's why I've had to rebuild everything. Uh, they just did not really understand what a work being out in public uh, needs. Um, and, uh, but by and large, I've had just great experiences with, uh, with uh, fabricators, lighting designers, engineers. I've, I've had two engineers who I loved and who were really great who retired. You know, so I'm on my third engineer and he's a young guy. And uh, I, I think, I, I hope I'll be using him for the rest of my life. Um, other questions? Anything else? I just think that's such a huge and important insight for people that are thinking about going into public art that it's that it's you know it can't just be on you Don it's got there's there's got to be a team to help solve these you know it's like everything scales up <laughs> not just the sculpture but yeah. all the other issues attendant to making a sculpture. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you uh, before I started doing public art I don't have what you would think of as traditional sculptor skills. Uh, in graduate, in undergraduate school, I was a history major, American history. Uh, my last semester in college, I took a woodworking course and a ceramics course, and I just got sucked into ceramics. So I went to graduate school in ceramics. When I came to Oklahoma, I was teaching sculpture and ceramics. Um, but I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't know how to weld. You know, I had done some torch welding in high school. That was it. Uh, I had never made a mold of anything. I had never cast anything. I, I didn't know any of the real sculpture skills. Um, and that's why all my early works, they're like uh, tied together with string or they're uh, held together with masking tape or, you know, whatever, glue, you know, this is, uh, and that was the charm of some of them. But at one point I got a big studio and I got an assistant and he knew how to do stuff. Uh, a great sculptor named Tony Stanzione who lives in Brooklyn uh, and he worked for me for about five or six years. And I loved the relationship. Uh, and I loved just having access to more things. And it made me realize, you know, if you need something done, there's people who will do it. And one of the things that really attracts me to making public art is the interaction. I love working with fabricators. I love working with uh, the administrators and talking to the, the people in the town who are gonna be using the work. Uh, that All of that interaction is so different than being alone in the studio. And while I still spend most of my time alone, not in the studio, but uh, sitting in front of the computer these days, uh, I love the interaction. You know, it, it, it feeds me and uh, it suits me. Romy, did you have a question? I do. I have one. I mean, I have a lot of questions. I've really enjoyed your presentation and learning about your art. Um, but I, I would like for you to talk more about the storage. Oh, OK. <laughs> well. One of the great things about public art is before it's even made, you've got a place where it's going. Uh, from time to time, I see uh, 
there are calls for public art where people are having temporary exhibitions and they're looking for something to go in their park or on an art walk or something. I don't have any big sculptures in storage. Some people do. Mark de Suvero has warehouses and lots full of stuff uh, and some artists do. When, uh, before I started making art and continuing now, I am a very prolific art maker and I probably have, I wouldn't want to count, but hundreds or certainly more, probably more than a thousand works in storage. And yes, some of them are like gathering dust and you can hold them in your hand, but others are, are really large things. Um, and I've, I've had different solutions for at different times. There have uh, been times when I cheaply or uh, through friends got the use of some uh, truck bodies that were sitting idle. Uh, the guy, uh, there's, at the moment I have a, a warehouse in Philadelphia, which is, you can imagine it's much cheaper than New York where I live, but I lived in Philadelphia for a while. And before I left there, I found this warehouse that was relatively cheap and I store my stuff there. Of course, it's, you have to deal with uh, roofs leaking and liability and burglar alarms and all that stuff. Um, but it was, I, I was at a, a talk uh, by, um, oh, now I can't think of her name. The woman who made the giant spiders, Louise Bourgeois. And, and somebody asked her, do you have any, uh, any advice for a young sculptor? And she said, yes, get storage space. You need storage space. Uh, there, was, there was a time when my studio was a 5,000 square foot old movie theater in Brooklyn. So it, it, had, it, was, it was huge. I had shelves with uh, I believe something like 4,000 square foot of shelf space. And I was making art out of all sorts of things. So whenever I uh, found stuff that I thought could be useful for art making, I would bring it back to this studio. Well, that was, that was great for the years I had it, but along with moving into making more public art, I gave up that giant studio and uh, have always worked in a more pared down uh, way since then. I would say on, be, on Romy's behalf, as, as the, the person here that works the largest, this would be her concern. You uh -huh. should know about her. She, she knit a sweater for an entire building. Oh boy, wow. Yeah, I don't know where yeah. it lives now. <laughs> it lives yeah. lives in dozens of people's homes. Oh my God! And a third of it's at Leap Coffee oh. Roasters. Yeah, Romeo, uh, I'm gonna look up. I have to well, see pictures of that. So while while we're on the subject just of this in general, and I understand if uh, if if there's a time limit to because you you know time is valuable. I get it. Um, in listening to you talk about the storage component of the studio spaces you've been in and everything, then, I mean, it's on my mind, but it wasn't until you said, described it, like, what's your insurance like? On my stuff that's in storage, I have uh, no insurance. I have liability insurance. And that's, yeah. that's it. Um, I am, uh, one, thing, one thing I have done uh, that may be helpful to some of you, maybe not to others, uh, is some of my favorite pieces and the ones that I think are uh, 
that I'll want to end up in museums instead of landfill. Uh, year by year, I've been giving them uh, to my son. So someday it'll be his problem, not mine. But that's, that is the truth, the stuff we make uh, could end up in landfill or it could end up in museums. Um, and that's quite a range, uh, but there's a reality there. I love that you're working as we're having this talk. Oh, isn't that great? I decided to, I've been making these mandalas uh, on with paper and thread. Uh, there's the reverse side. Yeah. And tape. Um, and this particular set of bands, I was like, I'm going to use every color of green thread that I have, and I'm going to see what that looks like. So I have 24 different spools of green thread, and this is going to have 24 bands of different green. And we're just going to see what that looks like. Yeah. There you go. I think you and I have a similar brain defect. <laughs> I should be so lucky if my brain is defective the same way your brain is defective. Well, it's definitely similar. Uh, in terms of time, uh, I don't know about all of you, but I could, uh, I could be here for another 10 or 15 minutes. Jennifer, did you have a question? I, I was mainly raising my hand because I'm storing, I, I own now, I believe, some of Romy's knit piece. Oh. But I always have lots of questions, um, including, I, I feel like um, when I talk to public artists, I'm, I'm a curator myself, but when I talk to public artists, it's, an, um, it's a lot of work outlay without any finances, without any sort of guaranteed finances. And I'm, I'm kind of wondering, I'm going through your um, website a little bit. Does that mean you need sort of a diversified uh, income stream uh, to be able to support that? Because you, you put together the projects and you put a lot of time into that. And then it sounds like pretty frequently you have to rethink those projects. And, and um, then sometimes you don't even get the commission. Um, so uh, I, how, do you, how do you figure that into your practice in general as a, as a working artist? Um, well, when I first moved to New York, uh, I got a teaching job. Uh, I taught at uh, Cooper Union, but I just did that for a year. Uh, then I, I got an NEA grant and that helped me out. Then I got a Guggenheim grant. Uh, I've, I've found, I've, one thing that I was very lucky with is my work got out into galleries and people were buying sculptures. And so I was really supporting myself really after just a couple of years of being in New York, uh, I was supporting myself by being a sculptor. When it comes to the public artwork, generally they, they pay you to, uh, to, if you become a finalist, you know, I, I don't, I hardly ever uh, compete in anything where they want to see an idea from, you know, as part of your entry. Uh, usually in these programs, they will choose three, four, five, sometimes as many as eight artists, and then pay those people to make a proposal. Sometimes they'll pay you $1,000. Sometimes they'll pay you $5,000. You know, it all depends upon uh, the, what the deal is. And so you do get something for making the proposal. Uh, it generally, if you were to figure out what you're paying yourself an hour for those, it's not very much. Um, but, then maybe you get to make the piece. Uh, I've found that um, all the skills that I had from being an artist and making stuff myself or with an assistant uh, had, had made me pretty economical 
I think most sculptors know how to make stuff without spending a huge amount of money. Now you do have to do things a little differently if they're going to be if it's going to be outdoors and in the elements. Uh, you have to build things so that they're really going to last. Um, but by and large, once I have a commission, I've been able to. Uh, I think I've made money on every commission. There are some that were ran pretty close, and there are some where. I've made as much as half of what the budget was. Yeah. And so it, it depends. And since I've been mostly just making uh, public art, I've been able to make a pretty good living at it. You can, you can see by my digs. Yeah, <laughs> very impressive library. <laughs> I want to know if you get residuals on the ziz. Like every time they sell a stuffed ziz, do you get a little cut? I mean, um, they they make little plastic ones, uh, and I I do. I've never I got a check once for I think it was like one hundred and sixty dollars mm -hmm. or so, but they're su they're supposed to give me something. Uh, there are very few pieces I've made that there are spin-offs like that. Uh, I've wanted to make something for the children's hospital that's a toy dog with a toy car that would come off and you could play with both of them. Um, but I just haven't really focused on it uh, doing that. Um, I, I know... Uh, I, I had uh, a friend who's uh, died uh, that his name is blank, blanking out on me. Uh, his last name is Argent and he made the big blue bear in mm -hmm. Denver. It's this giant bear is looking into the windows of the convention center. Uh, and uh, he went to Japan and had, or to China and had them make little ones like that. And he sells them at the airport and at the convention center. Uh, he died a, about a year or two ago, mm. um, but he, he, he made some money doing that. You know, I haven't really had an interest. I'm curious, we've got a few administrators here um, in, in the meeting and you mentioned, you know, that you enjoy working with public art administrators. Is there anything that you wish uh, admins, you know, would know or sort of keep in mind when creating calls or dealing with artists? Oh, uh, no, I've, in, in my experience, they've been uh, really good. You know, a lot of times, there is a problem that the artist wouldn't necessarily know about that they do, uh, like the Cleveland Indians thing, you know, um, that uh, be, be open and have, you know, real dialogues with, with the artists. Um, I, I like to uh, get involved with the people who live in a place and that's usually the most direct route is through the public art administrators. There they are, they know the community. Uh, if I wanna set something up, like I'm doing a piece now in uh, near Minneapolis, uh, they, they wanted uh, a sign for this town Bloomington that has an, a new area called South Loop. They wanted a South Loop sign uh, and they wanted it to really be a sign. Well, South Loop is right near this giant, like 20 mile long uh, wildlife refuge along a river. Um, and they have tremendous migrations of uh, 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 200 different species of birds. And I thought, uh, you know, 
there's, and it's also a community that's filled with people who have migrated there. So it was also pretty interesting uh, metaphorically. I decided I would just have a sign, but then sitting on top of the sign, I would have a bird. So what kind of bird? Well, the administrator there introduced me to people at the wildlife refuge. They told me their favorites and all that. And I sort of settled on uh, songbirds. And then we went online and they were able to put together an online contest, you know, uh, and we, we I, I gave 10 different species of birds and people voted. And uh, we're doing a, uh, what do you call it? A, a golden... Uh, goldfinch? A goldfinch, exactly. We're doing a <laughs> I'm goldfinch. looking at your website, so. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> well, you're, 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 uh, you're slightly ahead of me, so that's good. Yeah. Um, to for Minnesota day, knowledge, Jennifer. When, when well, we, I was particularly interested in the Minnesota, uh, the Minnesota sculpture because I'm from there, not all. So yeah, <laughs> I was okay. happened to be stopped on that page. Yeah, that's great. Um, the the sign I wanted it to look like a regular highway sign that this bird had perched on top of, uh, and one the highway people wouldn't hear of it. You know, it's going to confuse people. Uh, to the South Loop people and the Bloomington people wanted their logo in the sign. And so I'm not thrilled with the way the sign looks, but I, I think we're going to have a real nice looking bird on top of it. <laughs> um, when I finish this, the reason I have to get off, uh, off this call is I'm having a call with some people in uh, San Diego where I, I won a competition to do something uh, for the family play area at the San Diego airport. And the way they did this competition, they just had their finalists talk about how they would approach it. And so I didn't have to give an idea. But now I've this call is to start talking with the airport people about what my ideas might be. And the public ad art administrator there, um, who is named uh, Lauren Lockhart, her old job was working at the San Diego Children's Museum. And I had mentioned in my presentation that the first thing I'd want to do is start talking to people at a children's museum, because they know how to make exhibits that kids of all ages are going to want to play with for a long time. Um, so that was great. She's putting me in touch with the people who are now at the uh, children's museum in San Diego. So by, by and large, my, I, I can't think of Offhand, I can only, I can't think of any relationship I've had with a uh, art administrator that has not been warm, productive, uh, and easy. Uh, I, I balked for a moment that because I was thinking of something, it wasn't the art administrator because he was great, uh, but I did something at the, uh, the Atlanta airport that my idea was extravagant and it was something made out of grand pianos. They wanted something hanging in, in this, it's an airport, so a giant space in a new international arrivals terminal. And I think of Georgia as uh, music as being so important in Georgia. And when I was down there visiting, you know, I went uh, to Macon and visited the music studios down there and stuff. At any rate, the architect there was so in love with his architecture that he didn't, he didn't really want anything there. So what I was designing kept getting 
lighter and airier. And finally, it's, it's just a bunch of crystals hanging up on a mesh. You know, it practically disappeared. Uh, which I'm, I like the work there, but uh, there's all, all these pieces have stories, you know, and some are more elaborate and more interesting than others. Um, but ev every one you start is a project. This San Diego piece is supposed to go in in 2024. I'm doing a piece that I'm hoping will go in next fall in, uh, in Arlington, Virginia, that started, I bet, five, six years ago. Uh, and one thing or another, they kept getting delayed. And I have this 50 foot tall uh, uh, wind turbine blade that I've been storing for all these years. Oh, here's something. If you're writing a, a contract for a piece you're going to do, get storage built into it. If because of delays at their end, you have to store this stuff, you shouldn't have to pay for that. So yeah. there's some advice. Yeah. <laughs> That's good advice. Yeah. Well, all your uh, your good experience with arts administrators sounds like you've met our own Robbie Kinzel at some point. I don't think I have. In in my window, she's right underneath you. But oh, uh, everybody is. <laughs> I I just have five pictures up on top, and uh, that's you, right? <laughs> <laughs> Must uh, be. But no, great I'm, to meet you. I have, I have, uh, oh, there's, there's Robbie. Hi, Robbie. <laughs> so your job is? I'm with the city of Oklahoma City. Okay. And our program is almost nine years old. Oh. Under the uh, 1%, so it's, it's relatively new. When, uh, when I was in Oklahoma, uh, on I-35 at a turnoff near uh, Moore, I went out there and I was doing a guerrilla activity, just uh, putting, stretching some mylar ribbon and making something that would dazzle in the light and look like a lake. And as I'm up there doing it, a uh, semi was making the turn and it turned over on its side. And I oh thought, my oh my, I thought, oh my God. And I got, and I, I, I tore the piece down and wrapped it all up and ran away. And I had talked to highway people about it. Um, so I went to the hospital and I talked to the driver of this truck. He didn't see my piece at all. He had an empty truck and he was going too fast. That's all it was. But that's my whole uh, public art experience in Oklahoma. Wow, that would be yeah. scary. <laughs> yeah. Somewhere I'll, I'll try to find pictures of that and send it to you. I didn't well, getting- We would love to receive your interest and we do pay finalists for their designs. Right. They pay pretty handsomely, so please check it out. Okay, I've, uh, I've competed in a, a couple things. I know in uh, maybe there was something outside the museum in Norman or something like that. Um, but when I see something in Oklahoma, I, I generally toss my hat in the ring. Uh, and nothing yet, but I'm, I'm optimistic. <laughs> um, Donald, could I ask how many, how many applications do you submit in a year? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I would think maybe 30 or 40, you know, and maybe I become a finalist in uh, four or five and maybe I get to do two or three of those, you know. So 
Those are great statistics. <laughs> they really are. I think, Those are great. I think we do get some, um, and yeah. you're you're really a very accomplished um, and successful at this. So I think we do get some disappointment from artists that get frustrated. Um, I understand that, you know, mm -hmm. but uh, I've been doing it a long time, um, and uh, it's it's worked out okay for me. But and I, it's in my makeup that when I don't get something, it doesn't crush me. You know, I, I'm on to the next thing. Um, and, and I think that that story of the Tampa piece that uh, I don't think I ever told the people in Virginia Beach, you know, well, this is really a variation of something I designed for Tampa. Uh, but, you know, now that this is recorded, I guess. <laughs> We can blackmail you. <laughs> um, the uh, uh, but I but I think that that's that's a good story when you uh, are designing something, even though we call it site specific, an idea, uh, almost any idea. There's more than one place it could go, or it could be the germ of an idea that's going to go someplace else. So if you really pour your heart into something and don't get chosen, it's not a waste of time. Plus, you know, what we do it, artists do it because they love creating. And while you're creating this, that's the, that's the energy, that's the joy. You know, the building it is a lot of work. Um, so if you just get to think it up and don't have to build it, there's, there's something okay about that. Okay, I am going to uh, log off, but I, I really enjoyed this. Um, and I, I, uh, I'll, I'll see you all down in Oklahoma City someday. Thank you. Post, post oh, thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, thank, thank you so much for your time. Joining us.